Okay, moving on from group t or from video two, we're moving to video three for uh, commercial fish stocks and commercial methods. And so we've covered the main methods that are used in New Zealand for um, for the bulk of the uh, fish stocks. And so we've uh, looked at the um, type, the areas where fish are caught, the demersal and pelagic and benthic zones. So here you go of the benthic and pelagic zones, if you remember from the last video. And uh, here are some definitions for your demersal and pelagic zones. Um, so you can have a look at those in your own time. Freeze the video if you like. But we'll go and have a look at some of these demersal fish. These are fish that live close to the bottom. They're associated with the bottom, but not necessarily attached to the bottom. Uh, so you've got things like a uh, snapper, especially in the North Island, is your main um, one of your main fish stocks. Uh, Terakihi, Gurner, Trevally, flatfish, uh, groper. Although groper can be uh, quite a bit deeper than than 200 meters, you'll get them um, right down to four or five hundred meters. The uh, uh, as well as blue fit or blue nose. Um, other species: barracuda, red cod, gemfish, stargazer, rig, school shark. Uh, a little bit of water how blue cod, um, butterfish, a lot of this which are a little more important in the South Island. Uh, North Island is tends to be a snapper is quite a big one. Um, so the snapper is uh, probably the uh, one that we're most interested in up here when we're fishing close to shore. These are also known as the inshore fisheries. Now if we go to the offshore fisheries, two, that's uh, 200 to 1,000 meters. Uh, our main species, orange ruffy, hokey, southern blue whiting, hake, silver water how, ling. Uh, these things are caught generally through uh, long lines, bottom long lines, or uh, deep water trawling. And the orange ruffy is probably one of the more valuable of those, of those fish. Uh, and it used to be uh, in quite a bit of ab abundance, but now there's very little of it left. So we don't get nearly the... Um, nearly the uh, returns economically that we used to out of those. Uh, Hokie is currently the largest fin fish resource. Uh, it's been anywhere from 300,000 plus tons to 90,000 tons depending on on the year and depending on the state of the stocks. Um, used to be mostly processed into uh, surimi which would be those little crab sticks and uh, the like that you buy when you get to, when you go to the fish and chip shop. Uh, they're also shaped into little lobster tails and dyed with red on one side and the like. So that's actually made out of fish, not crab at all, the crab sticks that you get at the, at the shop. Um, now, though, the, uh, they've moved on to different species and um, less valuable species, but the hokey tends to be processed into things like uh, McDonald's fish burgers and the uh, breaded crumbed frozen fish that you can buy at the store. So hokey, they've added that added value to the processing of that fish. Okay, a little history of the orange ruffy fishery. This is one that um, really was very poorly understood when it was when it was first started to be exploited. And the exploitation of it um, really could be uh, described as mining because uh, they found these giant stocks of uh, these fish uh, that were aggregating to spawn in deep water and they could go put a trawl net through and get 50,000 uh, kilos, 50 ton of, uh, of these fish on a single trawl over and over and over again. And so the market was uh, built for this orange ruffy it used to be called deep water slickhead but even orange ruffy is a marketing name and they didn't know that they were um, so old they looked at uh, growth patterns of these things called otoliths which you can uh, which are ear bones that you can cut and look at the rings and count the rings like rings on a tree and see how old they grow but the um, orange ruffy they thought that orange ruffy would be growing at uh, at the same speed as some similar species, but in fact they're very slow growing. So um, some of the oldest of them could have been spawned around the Treaty of Waitangi if they're uh, 150 years old. 
very slow growing. Uh, they live to depths of 700 to 1500 meters. And then also, um, the, it's a single stock management. So very classic, typical, um, where the stocks are looked at in isolation. And uh, if you look at the history of reportings of stomach contents of sperm whales over the uh, last hundred years, their diet has changed largely from fish such, such as hapaka and ruffy and the like to um, largely squid. So we don't really know what sort of effect we're having on them um, with uh, the deep, deeper fishing. Okay, so now that was the offshore uh, 200 to 1,000 meters. Now we go to the offshore deep water. So this is over 1,000 meters. You might catch a few ruffy in this area, but the main species, Oreo dories, and uh, some, you get it as well a little bit of uh, ratfish, which are now being processed and um, which used to be discarded, and uh, a few sharks and a few deep water cod. But uh, by, by far the main species are Oreo dories. Okay, so these are ugly things with big googly eyes, but they have um, beautiful fillets, beautiful white fillets, and they are also quite slow growing species probably not as slow growing as the uh, orange ruffy but um, uh, they they can be either the the uh, smooth oreo or the spiky oreo and there are actually uh, there's another a third sp species as well these ones are like sandpaper they can lock together in the cod end of the of a um, uh, of a, a trawl net and if you are unlucky enough to stand on these in the pound and when you're when you're moving the fish around in the in the uh in the trawler these spikes can go right through your the bottom of your gum boot no trouble so these ones are kind of slimy and and smooth and these ones are are kind of spiky so but they live in the same areas and deep deep sort of muddy sediments okay pelagic fish a coastal shelf, the main species would be, these are the inshore pelagic fish, jack mackerel, kawai, trevally, gray mullet. And you can see they're tightly schooling and consequently are often targeted by purse saners. Offshore pelagic fish, uh, the main species, skipjack, albacore tuna, southern bluefin, big eye tuna, yellowfin tuna. And you'll see these things are schooling. Uh, uh, fairly, you could say that they're fairly tight schooling, but they're not as tight schooling as, as a trevally and the like. Uh, they'll be a little bit more spread out, still targeted by purse saying, especially the skipjack and albacore. Um, if you can find New Zealand skipjack tuna in a can, then uh, that's actually a fairly well-managed fishery. It's one of the few tuna fisheries that is managed well, that's not being depleted. Um, the, su the southern bluefin tuna are, seem to be falling off the, uh, the edge in terms of biomass, falling off the edge of a cliff. And um, so New Zealand fishers tend to stick to their limits pretty well, their quota pretty well. But there is a, the, once these fish move into international waters uh, on their annual spawning migration, they are pretty susceptible to all sorts of pirate fishing and over un, overfishing, unreported fishing. Um, but they're taken on their migratory path as they move across the Tasman. And you might have seen them on the uh, fishing shows uh, down where people go down off of the west coast of, uh, of New Zealand and go and target these things besides be, behind hokey boats. Um, the bottom-dwelling shell, shellfish, okay, our main species, rock lobster, crayfish, um, rock, rob, rock lobster is what crayfish are called in most every other part of the world, uh, the spiny lobster. Uh, you do have the um, American lobsters, which uh, have, are the ones with the claws. We have the spiny lobster, and then there are also scallops, dredge oysters, and pawa. Okay, the difference between the the two, the crop, the uh, lobsters are generally caught with um, with pots. The scallops and dredge oysters caught with a dredge, and pawa are hand gathered. Okay, and these things have a lot of cultural significance as well as being a uh, important um, commercial fish, and of course. 
that leads to uh, some confrontation over the um, rights to the, utilize that resource between the two species or between the two sectors, recreational and commercial. Okay, we're going to look at the next um, type of uh, fishing method that is used by commercial fishers. This one is used to a lesser extent, but is uh, uh, historic, historically was um, quite important, especially for people who didn't have access to deep water, uh, a lot of boats, but uh, and these things, uh, at least a few years ago, could still be seen on the Newfoundland coast in Canada and on Maine. Um, but uh, uh, but they were historically quite a uh, an important fishery. So what happens is this exploits the biology of fish that live along the coast, and so when the fish swim down the edge of the shore, they'll hit the shore, they'll migrate along it, they'll be traveling down along the shore, and so they come to this natural barrier that could be made out of sticks or it could be net, could be anything really that um, is acting like a natural barrier. And so then this fencing, they swim down along the fencing, come in the opening, and then they tend to swim along the edge, just traveling in one direction. And then when they go here, they tend to swim in a straight line. So this weir can be of, ver this holding pen can be of various size, but the fish will tend to, tend to travel in a circle and stay in this area. All right, so then you can come and this will naturally collect a lot of uh, fish within it, and then you can come and scoop them out with nets. And here's a picture of what a weir might look like um, from shore. Okay, they tend to be along sandy shores, but it can be placed along rocky shores as well. All right, so this is a beam trawl. All right, we looked at trawls before, and they didn't have um, uh, cages. Uh, they had a ground rope that had uh, lots of a or a chain, which would, was called the tickler, and uh, then a header rope, and they were kept open by weight along the bottom and floats along the top. Now these beam trawls are um, actually a welded framework that stays open uh, because it's welded into that pattern and then trawled along on sleds. Okay. And these were used uh, extensively before um, before uh, petrol, diesel, and steam-powered boats came along and were powerful enough to, to pull quite wide nets. Okay, dredging, very similar to a beam trawl, um, but it's used more for um, scallops and oysters, and it has a steel frame that is dragged across the seabed. Okay, so that's a steel frame with a steel, usually a steel net, because uh, what comes into it is quite heavy, would tend to rip nets and, and all, and they tend to have little forks that, that uh, sort of scrape the, the bottom. Okay. And then we have a lift net, okay? So this thing is just something that's laid along the bottom with a frame like so and then lifted from a central axis out of the water. And if we have a look at what a big one looks like, so these things on this big frame will be let down to sit on the bottom, and then the fish will just swim over this. Sometimes they are there's a lot of bait thrown out, sort of a burly to draw them in, up over this. They lift this up, and then all the fish just slide down to a central collection point. Okay, and then uh, lining, all right, um, line fishing, premium fish, snapper, or groper, um, they can be caught, you can use do this with dropper rigs or fish um, with hook and line, and you catch individual fish, and this is how, uh, this is the commercial fishing that I did the mo most of in the States, where we would go out and essentially bottom fish for for two, three days in a row. And you could catch 400, 500 uh, pounds of fish in a day. At three bucks a pound, you're still making a reasonable amount of money for uh, two guys just going out and, and uh, hitting it hard. You'd fish for uh, 18 hours a day. So it was a little less like a charter and a little more like a job, but still quite fun. And um, the fish would come up in, in premium condition. Uh, chuck them into the ice, gut them and put them in the ice straight away. So here we are, there's the recap of all the fishing methods we've discussed in these videos. 
Persane, trolling, long line, trolling, gill nets, weirs, dredging, squid jigging, potting, hook and line, beach seining, and free scuba diving, power and muscles and the like. And so you um, should get to know these ones, be able to uh, sketch them out and know at least a couple of fish that are captured by each type of, uh, of each of these methods and where um, these methods might be deployed uh, for your exam.